Hi everyone, welcome to Hinsdale Chapel. I'm Chaplain Michael Kingdom here at Advent Health Hinsdale. Thank you so much for joining us today. And joining us today is Pastor Dan Smith, our great friend who has pastored over 45 years throughout his life and recently has retired in 2019 from Garden Grove Adventist Church. He has been through numerous mission trips towards Asia, including India, Philippines, Malaysia, and Thailand, where he had grown up. Recently, he has started a nonprofit together with his team called Grace Force that supports mission trips and supports mission projects all over the world. So we'll be hearing from Pastor Dan Smith, but first, let us enjoy some special music from our friend, Victor Moreno. Welcome again. We're trying to answer some of the hard questions that gather around when we're sick or in a hospital and say, what's going on? But I'm going to talk about the word hope. It's one of the great words of the Bible. I grew up in Thailand and uh, we were missionaries. I speak Thai. And so when those boys who were a soccer team stopped off in a little cave, and they went in a little way thinking they're just going to have a break in a cave and then an hour later come back out. <laughs> And all of a sudden, uh, the rain's flooded and the water's come in and they have to go deeper and deeper into the cave. And finally, they're back there so far. There's no light. There's no food. There's no nothing. They're back there. They're all together. They're dry. They're sitting on a shelf. But there's nothing. They have no way to know that we're out here working on it, that we're digging a way to get in there, that we're trying to find a way of having uh, scuba divers go in there. They don't know any of that. They're just in there. And I wonder how long they held on to hope. And so I'm sure that captain, uh, the coach was there trying to keep them going. And you're just sitting there. You don't know if it's day or night. You don't know anything. It's just dark. When all of a sudden, a head pops up in front of you. And a British scuba diver. And there's a light. The first light you've seen in over a week. 
You don't know how you're going to get out. You don't know what's going to happen next. But finally, there's a little bit of hope. There's a light. There's a light. And people are coming up with a plan, and they get you some scuba gear, and they give you a tank of air, and you pull along a rope, and you come out into the daylight, and you're not going to die at 12 years old. There's hope. There's hope. God is a God of hope. And I just want to offer you the hope that is in Jesus and God of hope. I had prostate cancer last year. You sit in a room and a doctor looks at you and has his biopsy results. And he says, um, you have cancer. Aggressive cancer. <laughs> High risk cancer. And you walk out the door and you say, whoa, you know, I'm 67, 68 years old. Maybe this is it. Maybe I've done all that I'm going to do. Maybe I've just got weeks. What do I want to do with whatever weeks I have? I thought, well, should I write a book or should I build something or what should I do? Or should I just travel the world trying to be on beaches so I just enjoy the, my last few weeks? And then a doctor walks into the room and he says, no, <laughs> you're not going to die in a few weeks. We're going to give you hope. You can survive this. This is a treatable cancer. We're going to get you well. And they get me into a treatment and big machines and, and now my numbers are good and I've got hope. Thank you, Jesus. And so I just want to give you hope today. Never give up hope. You know, one way or the other, there's going to be hope and what God is going to do is just, I make all things new. God is a God of hope. He's got answers. He is bigger than whatever problems you and I have. He can deal with it. And so I just want to put that word into your mind and never lose it and give it to everybody you have any contact with. God is a God of hope. Never let it go. God bless. One couple on the island of Romblon in the Philippines lives on property which they believe God has generously entrusted to them to develop for God's service. Ike and Jerby are retirees who devoted their time developing these three hectares of land to become useful for the Lord's work. While making use of their time, they dedicated their attention, money, and effort to improve this property to become a camping site for Adventist youth. Well, even, even before we acquire this uh, property, we have already a plan to share to the work of the Lord. That is uh, to provide uh, a campsite for our young people. And the Lord is wise enough to give us this property. And so we use it right after we buy it. Young people come around and have their camping and they enjoy their activities here. So when we acquire this property, so I said, we will give this to the Lord. We will develop this place and give it to the Lord. In a way, our children can survive and many will be blessed yet. Generosity is not learned in an instant, but it is acquired through experiences and opportunities to give and to be a channel of blessings to others. One time, it was uh, Friday and supposed to be paid day. We were not uh, able to receive our salary, but we prepared our tithe to be given on the Sabbath. So we have nothing, and uh, we pray to God for a means where we can get our supply until the salary arrived. So we went to the church, and a youth approached me and told me that he has prepared a sack of kamoti for us. On the following day, Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, a woman also told us that she has uh, brought us uh, two bunches of bananas so we gladly receive it we know that the lord is very good because he knows that we are returning his property his money if we are faithful in returning what is the lord's the lord will surely bless us ike and jerby were inspired to share what god has blessed them with 
and to leave a legacy of generosity to those who will follow behind. Since we are really the steward of the Lord, we are not the owner of everything. Everything is the Lord's. So my message to our brethren that they should remember that we are transient in this world. We are passing. We want to help His in the coming of the Lord. So by returning what is in us, it might help. It might help His in the Lord's work. So time will come. We cannot use it anymore. What shall we do if we cannot use? While there is time yet and it can be used, give it to the Lord so that it will help His in His return. If you'd like to learn more about how your legacy can bless future generations, visit adventistmission.org slash planned giving.
Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was sat down on the right hand of the throne of God.
serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations.
the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?
Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
Think about this. What does being content feel like to you? And can we be content while we're waiting? In a letter to his friend Timothy, the Apostle Paul writes something that seems almost shocking. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Really? Content with just food and clothing? We have all those things, but are we content with them? We live in a culture that is constantly marketing products that promise to make us happy. We can't possibly be fulfilled without this new phone or pair of jeans. But what really makes us feel whole are not things. Do you have someone who loves and cares for you? Do you have joy in your life? Do you feel at peace? If we can answer yes to these three questions, we have so much to be thankful for. Experiencing love, joy, and peace in our lives is so much more satisfying than the feeling things may give. In fact, Christ has provided everything we need to be content. Because he is alive, we have hope. He loves us, which frees us up to love others. We have peace and can find rest in him. We have joy because he has overcome death. May you find hope, find love, find peace, find joy, and find contentment in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is the light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases, my comforter.
So I'm wondering, uh, when was the last time you were at an airport and discovered that your flight was delayed? I mean, you go up to that place where the flights are posted and you see on time, on time, on time, delayed. And that delayed flight is yours. But how long will it be delayed for? How long will you be sitting there or standing there waiting to board? And sometimes they know and sometimes they don't. It might be an hour. It might be two hours. It might be four hours. You might have to come back the next day. But that's the question of a delay, isn't it? It's the question, how long? There's a song in our Bible. I mean, we call it Psalm 13, and it is credited to King David of Jerusalem. And this song opens abruptly with the two word question, how long? Listen to it. David will ask this question four times in two verses. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? How long, how long, how long, how long? This is the cry of someone who is worn out from waiting. And if you find yourself navigating desert space, uh, the land between, I'm guessing that that question, how long, might be a, your question, a question that occurs to you. How long will we be making offers on houses to discover that we've been outbid by somebody else? How long will I be applying for another position within my organization uh, to discover that they've once again selected somebody else? How long, how long? How long will I be wrestling with this habit, with this addiction? How long? It's the question of those who are worn out from waiting. And I think the question, how long, is very appropriate for a group of people we see crossing the wilderness in the early pages of our Bible. Uh, the, the Israelites, they leave Egypt, the land of slavery, and they're headed to a place called Canaan, the land promised to their ancestors. Now, it does not take that many weeks to get from Egypt to Canaan. But the Israelites, they are in the desert for years. Why? And I think a short but accurate answer is that they are in trust school. You see, uh, when they leave Egypt, they do not leave Egypt as a well-ordered group of God followers. They depart Egypt, they exit Egypt as an unruly mob of ex-slaves indoctrinated in generations of Egyptian idol worship. And they're headed over to Canaan where they're supposed to be representatives of the one creator God of the universe and they don't know him. And I know that they don't trust him. And so the, the desert space, the wilderness, the land between, they're in trust school. It's as if God is whispering again and again, trust me. When you, when you run out of water, trust me. When you run out of food, trust me. If you hear the rattling of Pharaoh's chariot wheels heading in your direction, I need you to trust me. Trust me in your waiting. Back to that song, Psalm 13, where King David asks four times, how long, how long, how long? Just a couple verses later, he says, but, but I trust in your unfailing love. God, I don't like this waiting. How long am I gonna be here? But I'll trust you. Now remember, this is one of the most powerful prayers that we can offer when we're navigating the wilderness of the land between. It's just a simple prayer that goes, God, I don't like this space, I don't want this space, and I don't understand this space, but I will trust you in this space, or help me 
trust you in this space. What I'm trying to say is this, that the desert, the terrain that we loathe, the real estate that we hate, has the opportunity of producing the crop that we need. See, the desert can be a greenhouse for trust to grow. And so if you're traveling through the land between today, my prayer for you is that God would meet you in this space, that he would sustain you each and every day of your waiting, and that for you, this desert space would be a greenhouse for faith 